Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the White House, and we are so honored to be here with you. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the White House First Lady Rosalind Carter. I'm, pleased, I'm also pleased to be working closely on an issue that transcends party lines with Senator Elizabeth Dole. And of course, my dear friend, First Lady Michelle Obama. And Michelle, I can't believe that it's already been three years since we started joining forces. From the beginning, Michelle and I both knew that we wanted to work together to support our military families. And we knew the American people would come out in full force. But I think it's safe to say that we've been overwhelmed by the support shown for our service members, our veterans, and our military families. It is so fitting that we mark this milestone by honoring all of you, our caregivers. As a military mom, this is something close to my heart. I've had the honor to meet with caregivers at Walter Reed, Fort Belvoir, and at bases around the world. Their loyalty, love, and devotion is truly inspiring. There is no truer example of that than two brothers my husband Joe and I met last fall. Kyle and Brett Pletsky are from Rockford, Michigan. Brett is up on the stage with us today, and Kyle is out in the audience. <laughs> Kyle, an Army specialist, was injured during his first deployment to Afghanistan, sustaining multiple pelvis fractures, an ankle injury, and nerve damage to most of his right leg. When Kyle first came to the White House in 2013, he was in a wheelchair. When he came to our home for a Wounded Warrior event, just a few months later, he was walking. Kyle will tell you that much of his progress is due to the fact that his older brother, Brett, was able to serve as his primary caregiver. Their experience is one shared by many military families, caregivers, and many civilian families. As baby boomers age and more people live longer lives with chronic illnesses, the number of caregivers among us is only going to increase. Like so many Americans, both Joe and I have had firsthand experience caring for our parents in the final years of their lives. I was so grateful that we could be there to help care for them and be with them in their last moments of life to do what family members do out of love. But I also understand how isolating caregiving can be, how you can feel completely cut off from your world as you knew it. The caregiving experiences also reminds me how much you appreciate the simple things, stepping outside to see the vivid colors of the sky or smelling the fresh air of spring. This is a shared experience I've heard about from so many caregivers. All of us here today want you to know that we so greatly value what you do. Your devotion is never taken for granted, and you truly inspire us with your empathy, compassion, and care. In so many ways, you have been caregivers to our country, angels walking among us and we cannot thank you enough. That is why we're all here today. You are doing your part to meet our sacred obligation to those who serve, and it is up, up to us to give you the support you need and rightly deserve. And with that, I am so honored to introduce a dear friend and one of our finest First Ladies, who along with her husband, continues a lifetime of public service someone who has been at the forefront of caregiving issues for decades, First Lady Rosalind Carter. Rosalind? Thank you, Jill. That was very nice. And I'm so pleased to be here today. 
with Jill and Michelle and Elizabeth and um, to honor our nation's military and veteran caregivers. Um, caregiving is, and I was going to say a cause very close to my heart, and you beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still, it, it's something that is very close to my heart. And I have been working on the issue for more than 25 years. And I became involved um, when we got home from the White House. Our um, local state university had a small endowment for a mental health program. And since I had been working on mental health when Jim was governor and then when he was president, and um, they wanted me to do something with them and start a program. <clears throat> and um, so in 1987, we established the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving that we call RCI. And um, we were working with those caring for loved ones with mental illnesses. And we were doing that because it was the, the um, endowment was for mental health. But by that time, I already had a really good program, mental health program at the Carter Center, which we had developed because we got home in 1981. And, uh, but it's, it quickly spread to, to be for all caregivers. Um, over the years, with generous support from Johnson & Johnson, who's been an invaluable partner, we've taken two evidence-based programs, one of which we helped uh, develop, uh, for those caring for loved ones with Alzheimer's and adapted them to the communities. You can't take a program and just, just like it came um, from the research center, you have to adapt it to the communities. Um, now our country faces a new challenge. Over one million of today's caregivers are military families and are adjusting to a new normal as their loved ones return from service bearing both visible and invisible wounds. As a Navy wife myself, I experienced the challenges of balancing family and work while my husband was at sea, and I cannot um, imagine how it would be to so eagerly anticipate a loved one coming home, and instead of unbridled joy um, to those caregiving demands um, that never, never um, before imagined. And I know that you, um, you all know how I feel and I know how you feel about this, having been in the, working this so long. The impact of these demands can have devastating effects, leading to strained family relationships, poor health, and difficulties in the workplace. When Michelle first announced the Joining Forces Initiative, I wrote her and offered to help. We were already working with military families in my state. Um, and I thought the lessons we had learned working with that and also working with other caregivers for so long, um, we might be able to help. And again, with the support of Johnson & Johnson, we launched Operation Family Caregiver in 2012, 2012. Um, it empowers caregivers by teaching problem solving and coping skills. It is evidence-based and is tailored specifically to individual families. Each family is assigned a caregiving coach who is available either in person or by Skype. The coach works with the family for four to six months. I'm especially proud that one of Billy Carter's daughters, um, granddaughters, Mandy, served as one of our coaches. Her husband came home from Iraq um, wounded, so she knows firsthand um, what the problems are, what the challenges are. We rigor rigorously assess the program's impact and I'm pleased to report that Operation Family Caregiver makes a difference. Mandy has told me about her experiences and how caregivers who have completed the training say they are more satisfied with their lives, have fewer trips to the hospital, and less, suffer less depression. Operation Family Caregiver is helping to create stronger, healthier families among those who have served our nation, and we now have four new sites that I'm proud of. Buffalo, New, New York, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, San Diego, California, and Killeen, Texas. Well, all of us here today mourn the loss of life at Fort Hood last week. Our prayers are with the families of the, of the victims. We must honor them and their loved ones by acting now to increase the support services available to them. We invite other organizations to join us um, with um, 
with me here today is Dr. Lisa Eason, who's Executive Director of the Rosalind Carter Institute, and some of the Operation Family Caregiver staff are here in the audience, I suppose. Um, we all can be so much more effective working together, and we welcome the opportunity to share good programs. Well, one of the best things that's happened to the caregiving field is having Senator Doe become involved. She knows firsthand the difficulties faced by these military families, having been at Walter Reed Hospital for 11 months uh, while her husband was recuperating, and seeing the stress and the bewilderment of families not, known, not knowing where to turn when their loved ones come home with um, loss of limbs, traumatic brains, injury, with any serious health problems. She spoke at our annual summit at the Rosencard Institute last fall and is a wonderful, compassionate leader with the ability to get things done. <laughs> it's a pleasure to introduce Senator Elizabeth Dole. Rosalind, thank you so much for your very kind words of introduction and for the tremendous work that you've done over the years on mental health and caregiving issues. It's an honor indeed, ladies and gentlemen, to join you, First Lady Michelle Obama and Dr. Jill Biden today, united in our support of America's military caregivers. Three years ago, almost to the day, I was in this room with the First Lady and Dr. Biden for the launch of Joining Forces, an initiative that's done a great deal to raise awareness and resources for our veterans and military caregivers and families. Thank you both for your leadership and your commitment to our men and women in uniform and their families. As we gather today, as Rosalind has said, I know we all hold a special place in our hearts for the Fort Hood military families. Our thoughts and prayers are surely with them. As many of you know, and again, as Rosalind has just mentioned, several years ago, my beloved husband, Bob, was hospitalized, and it was almost 11 months at Walter Reed. And I became a caregiver myself. And my eyes were open to the incredible challenges facing the caregivers of our wounded warriors. Across this country, a quiet, untold story of profound need is emerging. It's the story of America's hidden heroes, women and men caring for those who cared for us. Uncertain about their future, often alone, they soldier on with incredible strength and resilience. Today we say, you are not alone. Those 11 months at Walter Reed inspired me to establish a foundation for military caregivers. What we discovered almost immediately was the need for comprehensive evidence-based research. That led to my commissioning the RAND Corporation to undertake the country's largest national study on military caregivers and their needs. Last week, we unveiled the findings providing us the evidence, showing us why support for America's hidden heroes is so important. Rand said the health, well-being, and recovery of our wounded warriors is significantly enhanced by a strong, well-supported caregiver. They also said that there is no silver bullet. Our response has to be holistic, collaborative, and most definitely bipartisan. The RAND report is a clarion call. It is up to us, those of us in this room, and to people of goodwill across our great country to answer the call. And here is my answer. I'm proud to announce the launch of Hidden Heroes, the National Coalition for Military Caregivers, an effort meant to inspire individuals and organizations to work together to raise awareness and support for America's military caregivers. I've been humbled, blown away really, by the initial response we've been getting from leaders willing to join the coalition. Countless nonprofits are leading the way. Democrats and Republicans on the Hill have stepped up, 
like Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, Patty Murray, Richard Burr, and many others. Labor and the private sector is asking, what can we do to help? Rich Trumka of the AFL-CIO is turning on his organization. Faith communities are reaching out to their worshipers, like Pastor Joel Osteen, who will host a national service dedicated to the military caregivers on Sunday, April 27th. Many committed leaders and friends are here with us. We thank you one and all, and we look forward to working closely with you in the weeks and months ahead. I also must single out several significant sources of support. First, heartfelt thanks to Hank Greenberg's Star Foundation. A veteran of two wars himself, Hank knows the concerns and has, earned, has, and has enabled our mission to raise awareness and to support uh, military caregivers since day one. Second, warm thanks to Wounded Warrior Project, led by Steve Nardizzi, for serving as lead funder and partner on the RAND study. Steve, I know you're out there. Thank you so very much. And a big thank you to Jacqueline Mars for her incredible support. Over the course of my life, I've witnessed the extraordinary generosity of the American people and the fact that we are a nation of problem solvers. The circumstances of our military caregivers is a huge problem. And in predictably heartwarming fashion, the problem solving has begun. It's a privilege indeed to announce some early commitments from our coalition that I believe will inspire others. We know from our study that military caregivers are experiencing serious legal and financial issues. Today, we address those needs on two fronts. First, the Military Officers Association of America, MOA, with assistance from USAA and the American Bar Association, is launching a new website supported by one of my foundation's innovation grants. It will serve as a public portal for thousands of caregivers across the country to access financial, legal, and social resources. This initiative will be further enhanced through a major national collaborative effort facilitated by the foundation. It's called Lawyers for Heroes, a partnership between public counsel, the nation's largest pro bono law firm, the ABA, and MOA to offer free legal services to military families who are struggling the most financially. My heartfelt thanks to Admiral Norb Ryan and the leaders of each of these organizations for their incredible commitments. Next, we turn to another major finding in our RAND study, the critical need for increased caregiver education and training. I'm excited to announce that Easter Seals has stepped forward to lead a national effort in partnership with the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving, the Dixon Center, the National Alliance for Caregiving, USO, Atlas Research, the Family Caregiver Alliance, and Caregiver Action Network. This innovative collaboration will provide thousands of caregivers with valuable training across the country, importantly targeting those who are not currently eligible for the Veterans Administration Program, which Easter Seals administers. Online sessions will be available 24-7 for those who are unable to make the live sessions due to their caregiving responsibilities at home. We truly have an organizational A-team involved in this initiative. Addressing yet another finding, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and its foundation have made a significant commitment to military caregiver employment and workplace needs. The organization's very successful Hiring Our Heroes program will leverage its experience to assist caregivers who need to find employment in order to support their family and to offset additional caregiving expenses. Hiring Our Heroes will introduce caregivers to a myriad of virtual tools and incorporate them into an innovative virtual job fair program that will soon be unveiled. Its current job fair initiative will be expanded to focus on caregivers in areas near military treatment facilities. Additionally, the chamber will host a major summit for the business community in partnership with my foundation this September to promote employment and workforce-friendly environments for military caregivers. 
Tom Donahue and his team were one of the first organizations to enthusiastically sign on to the coalition. And as you can see, they're already committed to making a huge difference in the lives of caregivers. These early and impactful major commitments demonstrate the kinds of measurable solutions the coalition will focus on moving forward. I'm truly touched that we're joined today by caregivers from across America, including those who are part of our 50 State Caregiver Fellows Program, advising the foundation and raising awareness by sharing their stories. They are the heart and soul of everything we do, and they inspire us with their true acts of heroism. They also remind us why the work ahead is so important, so important that I'm committing today to convene us a year from now to report on our collective progress. We owe that accountability to the caregivers in this room and across America, and I know my partners feel the same. United we stand, divided we fall has always been a transcendent American motto, and it reminds me of one of my favorite historical anecdotes. It's the story of a night in 1945 when General Dwight Eisenhower was walking along the banks of the Rhine River, thinking of the crossing in which he would lead the Allied armies. He met a soldier and asked him why he wasn't sleeping. The young GI, who did not recognize Ike, said, I guess I'm just a little nervous. So am I, said Eisenhower. <laughs> Let's walk together, and perhaps we'll draw strength from one another. Ladies and gentlemen, I draw strength every single day from the stories of love and devotion demonstrated by our nation's military and veteran caregivers. May their commitments to their loved ones and to our nation inspire us to walk with them, and together we will draw the strength and support of Americans in every corner of this country. Thank you so very much. God bless you all. And may God bless this great land of the free, America. Thank you. I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the honor of introducing Melissa Fay Meadows. Melissa left her job as a nurse to serve as a full-time caregiver to her beloved husband, Staff Sergeant John Meadows, after his medevac from Afghanistan last year. The couple from Connecticut has three sons, one daughter, and a grandson, and their story of love and devotion to one another is inspirational indeed. Melissa, we salute you and welcome you today. Would you come forward, please? Good afternoon, I'm Melissa Meadows. Last January, my husband, Army Staff Sergeant John Meadows, was injured on a mission in Afghanistan and was eventually medevaced to Fort Belvoir here in Virginia. I left my home and children in Connecticut to meet his flight. I was expecting to be gone only a week or so, but I've spent the past 14 months in Virginia caring for my husband 24 seven. John suffers from traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, autonomic nervous system dysfunction, and a variety of orthopedic issues. Needless to say, life for him and for me can be a challenge. Every day I help him get up, get out of bed, and get ready for the day. I make sure he takes his medication, I drive him to his appointments, manage finances, and offer encouragement and emotional support every step of the way. We've been blessed with a wonderful medical care team who have helped John make significant progress over the last year. One provider had once described him as an advanced Alzheimer's patient. Today, he's doing much better. He's working hard to become an independent person. He's beginning, beginning to attend therapy sessions alone, and he's learning to safely operate a microwave. Not everything works on pop. <laughs> <laughs> he's also creating fantastic sculptures. But John still does have a very long way to go, and 14 months later, our family is forever changed. I lost my job as a nurse when I became a full-time caregiver. Our sons stayed home to, in Connecticut. They got a crash course in being adults and managing a home without mom. 
But through it all, I thank God for the friends and family in our lives. My love for my family has only grown stronger, and I couldn't be more proud to call myself a military caregiver. Last September, I had the opportunity to speak to the First Lady as part of a small group of caregivers. I was amazed at how intently she listened to me and the other women. Just being with her, I felt that she was someone who genuinely cared about us, our families, and our struggles. It meant the world to us as caregivers, as wives, and as women. And now it's my privilege to introduce her to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our incredible First Lady and tireless advocate for our nation's military families, Mrs. Michelle Obama. start by thanking Melissa for uh, sharing her story with us and for all that she does for uh, her family and for our country every single day. Uh, I also want to recognize the leaders of our military who are here today as well as everyone from Military One Source uh, for their generosity and support of today's event. And of course, I want to thank the wonderful women on stage with me today, Senator Dole, Mrs. Carter, and my outstanding partner on joining for forces, Dr. Jill Biden. These women have shown such tremendous leadership in this effort, and I am thrilled that we can all be together here today uh, to mark the third anniversary of joining forces. Today is just the first of a series of events throughout April that we will uh, celebrate the many ways our country is stepping up to support our military families in areas like employment, uh, education, community outreach. And I'm excited to kick this month off by honoring many of the folks who are here in, in our audience today, our country's extraordinary military caregivers. Now, when uh, Jill and I started joining forces three years ago, we did it because of people like you. And I just want to take a moment because when I look at you all and I see how emotional you are because you're here, because the country is recognizing what you do. And I know that touches you so much because we know you have incredible strength. We know that you have sacrificed so much. And so much of what you do goes unnoticed. We know that. And that's why it was so important for us to do this here at the White House and to have the people on stage here is just a reflection of our respect and admiration for your sacrifice. You all are some of the most unsung heroes in this country. And I know from firsthand experience, I have seen you all in action. As, as Melissa mentioned back in September, I had a chance to meet with her and. Uh, with four other military caregivers at the uh, Intrepid Spirit One at Fort Belvoir in Virginia. And this center is one of our newest and most cutting edge facilities. It's amazing. It's a place designed to help our wounded warriors and their families deal with the unseen wounds of war, uh, wounds like post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injuries. And when I met with these women, I was first of all instantly impressed by how incredibly poised and polished each and every one of them were. They were amazing. They were so smart, so incredibly articulate. They were exactly the kind of people that any company would want to hire and promote. That was my first impression. I was wowed by just how sharp they were. And then I heard their stories, and I was just blown away. They were dealing with daily challenges that would knock most people to their knees. Everything from helping their spouses bathe, uh, to adjusting their new prosthetics, to battling depression, anxiety, recurring panic attacks. One woman quit her job almost immediately after her husband was injured. Others have gone through counseling with their loved ones just to handle these newfound family issues. And they all talked about how difficult it was to uh, relate to their friends, even family members who 
didn't quite get what they were going through. I remember one woman shared how little those closest to us, her understood what it was like when her husband spent extended time at a care facility. She told us how a coworker had said, to her, oh, it, it must be like your husband's out of town for a while. <laughs> Another told me a story that has stayed with me uh, to this day. She said that when her husband first came home, everything seemed fine. Uh, it was that joyous celebration that Senator Dole mentioned. But then days and weeks passed, and she began to notice small changes in his behavior how he had trouble remembering things, and simple tasks became increasingly more difficult. And their marriage began to suffer. And she said, slowly, the husband she once knew just seemed to disappear. And she talked about the feelings of loneliness, and despair, and isolation, and fear. But she also talked about the love and determination that kept her there by his side. She knew her family needed help, but that didn't mean that asking for it was easy. And according to the RAND study that Senator Dole commissioned, that's a common feeling among the more than one million caregivers of our newest generation of post-9-11 veterans. Many of these caregivers don't have much of a support network for themselves. So they are dealing with these physical, logistical, and emotional responsibilities largely on their own. And that can take a serious toll on anyone. In fact, caregivers report more strains on their relationships at work and at home than non-caregivers. Often their own health suffers, and they are at higher risk for depression. And there are financial consequences, too. Uh, military caregivers wind up missing as many as three or four days of work a month, and that's if they have a job or can keep a job. So that means lost income as well. So the burden that these women and men bear for our country is real, and they shouldn't have to shoulder all of that alone. And that's why I'm thrilled that we have such a broad coalition of leaders here today because we're here to show these hidden heroes that we have got their backs. And Senator Dole told us about the many new commitments from our businesses and nonprofit organizations to uh, connect care caregivers with training programs and financial and legal resources and to provide better workplace flexibility. And we couldn't be more thankful for Senator Dole and her foundation's leadership to make these commitments a reality. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and today I'm excited to talk about a commitment that I'm proud to say grew out of the encounter that I had with Melissa and those four other caregivers at the Intrepid Center. You see, that meeting was the first time that the staff at Fort Belvoir had convened a group like that. That was the first time. And for one of the women there, it was the first time that she'd ever spoken with another caregiver, ever. But immediately, we could all see how powerful it was for these women to be talking to their peers. And soon enough, they forgot that I was even in the room. <laughs> It was so good. I mean, they were immediately problem solving. They were connecting with each other emotionally. They were solving each other's problems and directing each other to websites and, 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 and resources that could help. Um, it was phenomenal. And to the credit of the incredible doctors at the Intrepid Center, Dr. Uh, Hee Chin Che and Commander David Webb, they recognized the value of these peer-to-peer -peer connections. So they sprang into action right after they, that meeting. They told me that they would reach out to more caregivers and reconvene this group every week. And in the time since that meeting, another support group was formed as well. And between the two groups, uh, membership has grown to almost 50 caregivers just at Fort Belvoir. And today I'm thrilled to announce that the Department of Defense is gonna recreate that success story for all of our military caregivers. 
They're committing to form in-person peer forums like these at every military installation that serves wounded warriors and their caregivers around the world. They'll also be creating online tools and webinars so that caregivers who aren't able to attend an in-person forum can connect to their peers as well. And on top of that, the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, and many other organizations are committing to training 10,000 caregiving peer mentors, a commitment that will reach 50,000 caregivers nationwide. And together, these commitments mean that tens of thousands of our brave caregivers will have the added support they need, the support of a friend and mentor who understands what they're going through, you know, someone who can help them manage everything that's going on in their lives. So this is a big deal, and it, it is really just the tip of the iceberg, because everything that we're talking about today, from the peer forums to all of the new resources that, that Senator Dole mentioned, all of that is a supplement to the tremendous caregiver support offered by the military and by the VA. Now, for example, four years ago, my husband signed the Caregivers and Veterans Omnibus Health Services Act. And through this law, thousands of caregivers have received travel reimbursements and financial stipends of up to about $2,300 a month. And thousands more have received comprehensive caregiver training. They've received access to insurance through the VA. And they've received mental health care and counseling for themselves. And through this law, caregivers are eligible for up to 30 days a year of respite care for themselves, which means they can maybe relax, maybe re-energize, maybe just find some time to clean the house, <laughs> go grocery shopping. So we want to encourage all eligible caregivers to take advantage of these benefits and connect with a host of resources by, by visiting caregiver.va.gov or they can go to militaryonesource.mil. Because one of the things we learned at this meeting is when you're alone and isolated, often you don't even know what resources are there. And that is the frightening part of it, that people aren't accessing these resources because they're alone. So we as a nation have to find folks out there who are struggling on that, their own and help them to connect. And that's really what today is about. It's about connecting military families with the resources that are available to them and rallying our country to do even more. And that's why I'm so grateful for the leadership shown by everyone here today. And I, I want us to take a moment to just look around this room. We have got Republicans and Democrats We've got leaders from business and labor and from the military, and we're all coming together to show our military families how much we appreciate them. In fact, today reminds me of a moment from earlier this year when my husband shared the story of Sergeant First Class Corey Rimsburg in his State of the Union address. I had the chance to sit next to Corey as the President told his incredible story how as an Army Ranger, he had nearly been killed by a roadside bomb in Afghanistan, but fought back valiantly to speak again, to stand again, to walk again. And it was a moment that brought a divided Congress to its feet, and it inspired millions of Americans across the country. But if you remember that moment, you might also remember the man standing next to Corey holding his arm as he stood to wave to the gallery. That was Corey's caregiver, his father, Craig. And Craig, along with his wife, Annie, have stood by Corey's side since the explosion. Annie, his mom, makes sure that Corey is taking the right medications. She cooks his meals. She helps with his morning and evening routines. Craig spends an hour or two every day managing Corey's legal and financial paperwork and answering his correspondence. Corey calls Craig his secretary. <laughs> <laughs> but Craig will be the first to tell you that their family has never been alone on this journey. They have had a team by their side from the earliest days, 
from the extended family members who rotated bed shifts in the hospital to the military doctors and nurses who provided unparalleled medical care. The support started flowing in almost immediately after the explosion when an organization called the Ranger Lead the Way Fund bought airplane tickets so that more of Corey's family members could fly to the hospital in Germany. Then there were the Fisher Houses, which gave Craig and his family warm meals and beds to sleep on for 15 straight months. And the nonprofit that paid to retrofit Craig's house with wider doors and accessible shower. And the military, which provides a caregiving stipend to help pay the bills. And most of all, Craig will tell you about the support and flexibility he's been granted from his employers, a, a company called Telgen, where Craig was an HR director, is an HR director. And he'll tell you how when his wife had to leave her job at Kelly Services because of her caregiving duties, the folks there told her to call them back when she was ready. And when she was ready, she called them back, and they hired her back in a better position with even more flexibility than before. So today, Corey continues to make progress. He's been renting his own place since last June. And in six months or so, Corey will be moving into a new house, one purchased for him by the Ranger Lead the Way Fund and retrofitted by another charity. So Corey's story is the model because that's not true for everyone, but it is the model. This is the kind of honor and support that every single one of our wounded warriors and their caregivers deserve. That's our ideal. That's our goal. And to achieve that goal, we've got to follow through on these commitments we're making here today. And we've got to keep asking ourselves, what more can we do? That's the question for everyone watching today. How can we reach the Corey Rimsbergs and the Craig Rimsbergs who live in our own communities? That's what joining forces is about. And that's why this month isn't just a celebration, but it's a call to action. It's a call to all of us as Americans to match the service of our veterans and caregivers with service of our own. So again, I want to thank all of the leaders here today for stepping up to answer that call. And again, to our caregivers, the men and women in this room, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for showing us what bravery and courage and sacrifice really means. And I want you all to know that we are not going to quit until we serve you as well as you've served us. That is our pledge to you that joining forces isn't about photo ops or White House events. It's about making real concrete changes that you can feel in your daily lives. So we want you to keep working with us. Hold our feet to the fire. Let us know that you can feel all these things that we're doing. And give us feedback and criticize us and poke, poke at us. <laughs> because it's going to take all of us working together uh, to get you to a place where you feel uh, that you live in a country that appreciates your service, because you do. You do. Every time we ask, people step up. There is no one that has said no. So we want you to help us to encourage other people that are working and living in the shadows to step out and ask for help. That it is not a place of shame, but it is a source of pride. And that if they reach out, there will be people who will be ready and waiting to help. But we need to know that they're out there. And that's where many of you come in, being able to talk to your peers, uh, find the ones who are reluctant or who just don't know. So many of these caregivers are young themselves. They're babies. So they don't even know how to care for themselves. And that's where so many of you will be such a tremendous support. So we want you all to stay strong. Remember this day, because this is not the exception. It will be the rule. And no matter where we go or where we wind up in the next few years, I know Jill and I will continue to work on this issue just like these wonderful women leaders who hold up such a high bar. I wish you all would just slow down. <laughs> <laughs>
but we are pledging to keep working on this issue. So I want to thank you again for all that you do for families across this country and for your families at home. God bless you all, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you all.